Yes, hi everybody. I'm Christy Martins. I'm the Editor-in-Chief of Business Insider Germany and I would like to introduce my participants of the panel. First, as you've all known, it's Nico from number 26, followed by Tim. He's the founder of Deposit Solutions. Take a seat here. I'm, I'm going to sit in the corner. Sit here. <laughs> and then we have Alexander of Credit Tech and Markers from Deutsche Bank. So Tim, as everybody else has already presented, could you s shortly introduce your company real quick? Yeah, thanks for seeing. So my name is Tim Sievers. I'm CEO and founder of Deposit Solutions. And with De Deposit Solutions, we run an open architecture for retail deposits. So what is that? Retail deposits are basically simple savings products in German Tages and Festgelder. And they have the um, very exciting characteristics of firstly being extremely relevant in retail banking. So like almost every German owns such products. And secondly, it's very hard for many banks to really offer attractive products um, off their own balance sheet. So um, this is kind of a difficult product category for many banks. And with our platform, uh, we enable banks to serve their clients um, in this product category with the products of third parties or of other banks. Uh, and um, this under the existing client relationship. So that's the innovation about it. And that's great for the saver because he can now get best in access to best in class products through his home bank uh, without having to open another account anywhere else. So like in terms of user experience, this is comparable to how he buys shares, for instance, ha managing them all in one uh, brokerage account and one depot. Um, and for the banks, it's great because it offers them a solution for this really important uh, product category, which um, they wouldn't be able to support otherwise. And um, on the basis on the of this platform that we operate, we also have a, our own proprietary retail offering. You know, we don't want to wait for all banks to adopt this uh, platform, but we, with www.zinspilot.de, you know, go check it out. Um, we run a single account solution, so in case your bank isn't supporting or implementing our platform yet, um, people can go open one Zins Pilot account and then get access to all the products. Thank you, Tim. Okay, after having listened to all these company presentations, I think we all agree that fintech is a very wide sector with a lot of innovation showing no signs of slowing down and tackling every aspect which banking incumbents are already doing business with. Um, for me as a customer, I'm a little overwhelmed by all these options I can pick from. So the basic question would be who's going to win the client, the banking client of the future? Um, Nick, first question goes out to you. Opposite of winning is losing. I think we kind of lost somebody on the panel, so I'm missing Max and Valentin. How come they're not on stage, especially after you cancelled some accounts recently? <laughs> Yeah, good question. Um, obviously, that these uh, these their appearance or not them not being here today has no connection whatsoever um, to the account cancellation, which I'll talk to in a second. There was a an important business meeting that was uh, scheduled already before these cancellations happened, and, uh, and that's the reason why they're not here. On the cancellations itself, um, uh, I'm sure a few of you guys have read the news. Um, and, and the social media feedback on these cancellations. Um, we want to uh, sincerely apologize for the lack of transparency on this point. We have learned uh, from the feedback. At the same time, we have to these canceled users, we've is issued a um, press statement where it says explicitly there's an email address. You can write this email address and you can basically get your uh, account back uh, if after a few checks internally. So, and the good news is on this front, a lot of people have written us. More than one fourth of the canceled accounts have written us where we're going through them case by case uh, on, on the cancellation reasons. There's not only like a heavy use of, for example, ATM, but also fraud and so forth. So, which we obviously cannot take users back that fall into this bucket. Um, but the good news is really like these users want the product back because they like it. Um, they like the functionality. And, and, and so that's, that's also sort of out of this negative vibe that's a very positive feedback that we see and um, at the same time we're also thinking through a uh, fair use policy for these ATM withdrawals which we'll sort of uh, make public over the next couple of weeks. Okay Nick, thanks. Um, your claim is being Europe's modern uh, running current account and being better than the banks. So with this incident being a little intransparent about it, if I may say so, um, are you already losing clients before even winning them? <laughs> um, no, we're not. 
so ba basically also my point before on, on these users coming back, I think the fact that we issued a follow-up press statement really gave users confidence back, um, uh, not only the affected ones, but also the ones uh, that regularly sign up. So we've seen that sign-ups for our product is actually uh, a lot higher than it used to be before this uh, statement came out or, or, or b basically before this, uh, these actions took place. Um, so we really do not see that we're affected going forward by this, and we again apologize apologize for the transparency, <laughs> and we've learned our lesson. Okay. Um, you being a representative of the, well, we can say so, dinosaurs of the industry, um, cultural differences. Um, number 26 is a, bit, is a good example of how differently they act to um, incumbents. So you invest like 750 million euros into fintech companies. How much is the cultural difference between you and the fintechs? What's most yeah. stumbling? Um, so probably we will not invest 750 million in fintechs. We will invest 750 million overall. And for digitization. Yes, okay. right. So yeah. um, our target is not to be a venture capitalist, but to look for fintech cooperation in order to strengthen uh, our, um, our existing business and to make new business. I mean, I think uh, the cultural differences are in that part of the bank uh, where we have the cooperation with the fintechs are not really big. Maybe even Tim can answer this question better than I can do because he is working with my colleagues uh, on a cooperation, the same like the guys from Figo or um, from, uh, from WebID or some others. I think here, and I was sometimes even uh, surprised when I see the people from my organization, how quickly they adapted this different style of uh, how to do agile projects and all this kind of stuff. And I think the bigger challenge for, for a corporation like Deutsche Bank is to have on the one hand side the people that now really push hard for the digitalization and the other parts, maybe they are not so uh, affiliated to digitalization. And the end, the main challenge in my eyes is not that IT will become digital or the business. At the end, the entire bank has to go digital. The guys in legal and risk and compliance. And I think the time when we stop talking explicitly about digitalization is the point when we have done it because then it's just something special, uh, not something special anymore. It's just an integral part, and I think this will take us for sure a bit of a time. Okay, as you just mentioned, Tim, you work together with Deutsche Bank, you partner with them. Yes, so, so what is your <laughs> stake on that? Do you agree? I mean, maybe you have um, to, but <laughs> please be honest. <laughs> No, thanks. I mean, we, yes, we work with Deutsche Bank and uh, enjoy that very much. Um, it's obviously an honor for us as a small company to, working, to be working with one of the champions of the industry. Um, I think what, we find, what I find generally, like abstracting from the Deutsche Bank situation for a moment, is I mean, we talk with many banks and I get the sense that there is great clarity in basically all the top positions in bank management that in the past... Um, banking has happened differently than it will in the future and they have clear ideas of what they want to do to adapt to the situation and obviously they have client bases they have resources they're very powerful in that at the same time I think it's not so much culture that holds them up it's IT legacy systems so they already have millions and millions of clients and systems which are you know have been around for decades so they need to get those to transform with them and also they obviously these are re real banks fintechs aren't regulated banks so they have control functions to get on board too and I think that's a um, you know this is sort of uh, these are tankers um, and uh, they have other challenges uh, to cope with I'm not sure if it's a cultural one probably it's also a cultural one but uh, those are the ones that I see immediately in our discussions yeah but do the tankers need you in order to um, move fast and break things Sorry, I couldn't hear that. Do, do the tankers need you as a fintech in order to no, move I, faster I and break so. things? I think so. I think there is a great opportunity for symbiosis in the industry. So I think banks need fintechs, and I think fintechs need banks, because you know, this comes to the topic of the panel, who's going to win the client of the future. The fact is, the banks already have the clients. I mean, someone like Deutsche Bank has 10 million retail clients. You know, I'd, I'd need to spend a billion euros if, one of those if each client cost me 100 euros. So this is nothing you fund with a Series B or with a Series C. And it took them decades to build that, and they've got the brands to support the client's trust. So I think, if, in all likelihood, the big banks of today will be the big banks of tomorrow. But in order to serve their clients' needs better, I think it'll, um, fintechs can be the solution to the problems they face. Yeah. And also for fintechs, <coughs> this kind of reach, you, I mean, it's great to build up direct businesses. We do that with Tinspilot. We're very proud on you know, the sort of thousands of new clients we get each month. 
but the reach that the partnerships with the existing banks give you is just um, you know uh, very Kay. attractive I think okay you were mentioning your first product since pilot which is um, which was um, focused on uh, customers so now you partner with Deutsche Bank you partner with Flatex with different industry branches so who's basically your client is it the end consumer or is it more likely banks so the, the banks are our clients, and with Zinspilot, Zinspilot is like a client of our technology, right? Like Deutsche Bank is a client of our technology. Zinspilot obviously has savers as their clients too. We have, you know, it's a sort of two-sided marketplace. We, we're serving both sides. So, but who, you, who do you earn your money with? With the um, banking the banks, clients? The banks pay us, yeah. So the offer for the savers, the offer is free, for free. And the banks that source deposits as a funding source through our platform, they pay us for operating the platform. So this is our business model and, you know, where we work together um, uh, with uh, Zinspilot to address the clients directly, the, so the savers directly, the savers mm -hmm. don't uh, pay anything for the service. Mm -hmm. um, so you're in the business of uh, depositing money. Um, Alexander, you're doing the opposite. You're borrowing mm -hmm. money or people can borrow money via your platform. Um, lately, there have been critics um, mentioning that you kind of force people who are low on income into high interest rate credits. Um, what does one of your investors, the World Bank, say to that? So, I mean, as I mentioned during my speech, um, I think we need to be very um, clear, I mean, that we, that we are obviously, I mean, focusing um, to deal with the customer segment um, that's very different than, than the standard clientele that, for instance, Deutsche Bank is serving in most of the cases. So we are focusing on a customer segment that, I mean, struggles in many cases, I mean, because it, there's not even access, I mean, to basic financing options. And, I mean, there has been a report um, about financial inclusion and was actually marked as one of the key um, blockers for economic development um, that um, there is no efficient uh, credit infrastructure for a large fraction of the population all across the world. And, I mean, if you think about it, right, I mean, there are many things that can happen sort of like in your life unforeseen. I mean, there's an unforeseen expense. I mean, there's something, I mean, you suddenly need money. And if you, if you live sort of like, I mean, um, at, the, at the margin of income, then, I mean, it's much harder to, to buffer that off than if you have sort of like, for instance, lots of savings. So, I mean, what we do as a company is to make sure, I mean, that we can provide access to credit to a larger segment of the population. And this is obviously very much in line also with, um, I mean, the mission of the World Bank and in, in IFC um, to support such a mission in, um, in, in all parts of the world. Mm. Okay, all parts of the world, but Germany d doesn't account for that, right? You focus on mm. Poland, Spain and um, developing countries. Would Germany be a market for you? Well, I mean, I mean, Rome wasn't built in a day as well, so I mean, we <laughs> and the day also only has 24 hours. So when we started the company, we we said, hey, we want to focus on the markets where we see the highest opportunity, and this is those where the sort of like the gap um, between demand for credit, supply for credit in that that customer segment is the largest, and that um, applies mainly for for emerging markets, fast growing economies. I mean. I mean, newly emerging middle class, but of course, I mean, you find the same problem in Germany, in the UK, in the US, uh, so eventually, I mean, we hope that we have a chance to tackle those as well, uh, but further down the roadmap. <laughs> okay, um, you mentioned your business model, so you're uh, pitching to those who lack a credit history, right? Um, so how high is the credit default rate? Does that bother you at all? Well, I mean, the good thing about our technology is that we can very well control our credit risk. Um, so when we issue a credit or when we issue a thousand loans, I mean, we know exactly how many of them, I mean, are, are likely to default. We obviously don't know which customer is, is, is going to default, but I mean, there's always an inherent, an inherent credit risk. The most important thing is, I mean, that it obviously makes sense, I mean, in the overall um, the overall constellation of the company, so that you say, hey, I mean, how many people do you want to accept, and how many people, I mean, at the end of the day, end up end up uh, not not repaying. Um, so you, I mean, we can, for instance, say, hey, I mean, we want to have zero percent losses on our portfolio, but that might mean that we can, for instance, only accept ten percent of our customers, or we can say that we are willing to accept the higher share of losses, was twenty percent. Um, and we can accept 50% of, uh, of, of the population. Um, we um, figure that out in a way that it makes the most sense uh, for us as a business, so therefore, I mean, the loss rate is definitely fluctuating in that, in that corridor between um, lower single digits and sort of like in the, in the 20s, I mean, depending on the product category and, mm, and the country. Mm. 
So roughly every fifth credit won't be paid back. That's what you're saying? Um, not necessarily, um, but uh, it. Well, I mean, um, this is not the way how we how we think about it. But uh, um, probably on average, you can say that yeah, one out of one out of eight loans is mm -hmm. not be paid. Mm -hmm. Um, Marcus, mm. Alexander is doing algo banking. Your partner, together with uh, Deposit Solution, would uh, algo banking, the scoring system, be interesting for Deutsche Bank? Yes, for sure. I think uh, we, as an industry for retail, commercial, and wealth management customers, this is mainly based on cognitive tasks. So I think all the cognitive analytics and the machine learning is for sure a big technology opportunity. For us, it's more the question. Where do we have to go first? What are the, uh, the most important topics? I think Deutsche Bank is famous for investments business. Therefore, I think um, the first priority will be this kind of robo-advisory. But if we speak about robo-advisory, I think not the business models we see today are real robo-advisors. This will be probably the next or the third step. Here we are working with Finsight, with Ralph Heim and his guys in order to really um, bring together the investment competence of a big bank, the customer base, the brand, and then all these kind of uh, algorithms in order to improve the, the, the customer performance. And I think it's also um, a good lever in, uh, in order to make offerings uh, easier to understand. Mm -hmm. So this is, this is for sure a topic in terms of credit. I think the entire industry is, is in a situation as positive as never before. So risk costs in the prime business are as low as I think nobody can remember that these are uh, ex so extremely low. So probably it will be no priority, but I think we are uh, continuously working on improving our algos also in the credit scoring and machine learning for sure is also a topic there. Okay. Um, let me come back to business models, uh, Nick. Sure. So um, the incident, the recent incident, just kind of tackles the heart of the question, are fintechs able to make money at all? And um, as you offer your service for free, is it only VC money which um, lets you offer these dumping prices? <laughs> yeah, uh, no, it yes. is not. It it is? No, it is definitely not. Okay. So uh, our business model, as I quickly alluded to uh, before, uh, is really um, the pillar of the business model is these partnerships, mm -hmm. this pl financial platform that we're building. And yes, maybe there's some of these services are fairly low margin, but the good thing about fintech is also the cost side that goes against this is super low. Um, taking number 26 as an example, we're really set up as a tech company. So we have really extremely like very, very tech focused, all automated processes, um, very little also overhead, no infrastructure in terms of retail uh, branches and so forth. So really this cost side is so low that we'll be able to offer this service for free um, and just sub basically subsidize our cost through, the, through this platform that we're building. But actually costs must have been high because <laughs> otherwise you wouldn't have canceled the accounts. Yes, so our one of our main cost blocks is ATM uh, withdrawals uh, of, on which we're going to introduce this fair use policy as we announced. Yeah, but how do you earn money then? Through these partnerships. So, on in such a, I'm just using an example, illustrative partnership with partner A, let's say in the savings or investment space. Um, every time the user through number 26 buys uh, whatever, an ETF, a stock portfolio, whatever, um, he transparently sees that he needs to, that this costs some money. And this cost is in basically for the user, is then basically shared between our partner A and number 26. Okay. Um, Marcus, as number 26 is offering a new account type, um, there's a study which says 70% of the millennials, so-called, <laughs> would rather go see the dentist than uh, calling their bank. Are you afraid of number 26? Would they rather go to number 26 instead to the Deutsche Bank? No. Or to the dentist, maybe? No, no I'm afraid of the dentist, yes, but uh, <laughs> uh, not of numbers 26. I think um, uh, what was presented before is the kind of idea of the ecosystem. I think the key question will be uh, who has the customer base? Who are, who, uh, where do customers trust and do services uh, like that one? I agree that customers are not interested in 10, 50 or 20 apps to do banking business uh, in, that, in that kind of uh, way. And I think therefore I see us very well prepared. But regardless of uh, numbers 26 or any other fintech, I think it's important as a bank to have a known strategy. How do we want to digitize our overall business model? What are our strengths? And um, 
therefore, I think we are well positioned, but it's a fair point to say, look, banks, m uh, the bigger part of the assets is located with the people 50 plus, so the que your question is uh, to the millennials, for sure, this is uh, the next top priority, not only to safeguard the existing customers, but also to win customers. Mm -hmm. And I think for customers, regardless then who builds this kind uh, of application, it's the brand, do I trust in that? And it's maximum convenient. And I think these are the two decisive factors. And I think that's the most important. It will be the customers, customer who decides. Okay. Quick round with two minutes left. So um, after having touched a lot of topics, there's still more topics which could be discussed. But what is your opinion? Who's going to win the client? Are you going to win the client of the future? Well, and how? I think I mean you need to be very conscious about what's the problem that you're solving and what's uh, what's the customer segment that you're targeting. I think I mean in our case, I mean we're very focused. I mean on a specific customer segment, and we have a very strong revenue model behind us. So I think that's uh, probably one of the most important things. I mean for for building a fintech company, um, that you're conscious about these two things. Um, I think I mean you probably wouldn't. <laughs> Wouldn't disagree with that, right? Yes, uh, I, yeah. I think it's not an either-or question. So yeah. there's definitely an opening, I think, for new mm. fintech players to win clients directly and build their own client base. And it will be a race to critical mass to some extent, of course. But I think that's uh, now is the time to mm. do that for challengers. But also, um, you know, the same studies you just, just cited mm. uh, with regard to uh, the, the say bank um, bank clients um, analogy between going to the bank and to the yeah. and going to the dentist. The same studies also say, you know, yes, banks uh, clients are dissatisfied, but they are still reluctant to switch. So you know, a good friend of mine calls it uh, the sort of Stockholm syndrome of banking. You know, and it means that. Um, you know, probably, in the, as I said, big banks of today will be the big banks of the future. That's not bad news for fintech, though, because mm -hmm. fintechs got a role to play, uh, have a role to play in that setup too. Mm. And Nick, what do you think? Who's going to win? I think the, the the provider that offers the best user experience and the best products will win. I think the market is big enough for several players to exist, but at the end of the day, um, we hope that number 26 will be one of these players that offers the best user experience and the best products. Okay, I'm going to wish you all the luck to win the banking client of the future. Thanks mm. for having you. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Mm.